structure of your buildings. All of them are sound structurally, none of them are falling down. They're relatively clean and maintained. You do a good job of taking care of what you've got. They're old. And just like in your house, the e cooling systems go out, dishwashers go out, roofs go out. It happens in your public buildings, and it's happened in, in Cleveland as well. Uh, one of the things that, that we have seen as a need, and this is related to the educational component of your schools, is that we're recommending all of your elementary schools that every child goes to every elementary school with the exception of the two magnet schools. So for example, pre K and K would be in one building, one and two in another, three and four in another, five and six in another. And that creates an equity situation where there's no yay and or who has what who's got the better facilities, everybody is taken care of together and then a fair and balanced way. Every facility has needs. Uh, Y'all know you've got several buildings where the walls don't go all the way up. So therefore, those buildings need uh, walls extended and ceilings added. Uh, you need improved security, even though the district does a very good job of controlled access to the front doors. You have hardly any secure vestibules. Uh, you need improved camera systems. There are several things that need to be done to improve security. You have numerous re-roofing needs. And always that has to be the highest priority when you're looking at existing buildings. If you don't protect what's above, it's going to start impacting what happens underneath. Many of the buildings have electrical and mechanical needs. Uh, the district has spent money out of operating budgets to repair some of them. But many of them are, are 30 years old and 35 years old and desperate need of replacement. And the electrical needs have changed because technology has changed. And therefore, you're, you, you've tacked home electrical and you need to deal with some infrastructure issues there. Uh, this campus is an example of a site need. You've got drainage issues. Uh, you've got paving issues where the paving needs to be replaced. And, and that's seriously one of the needs here. Did I do that? So those are general needs and they vary from school to school and I've got them itemized in my detailed report. One of the things that we have recommended is that your 7th and 8th grade needs to be continuous with your 9th through 12th. And, and many people, you can argue that all day long and you can be right all day long. But when you've got reduced enrollment, 7th through 12th programs create a continuity of educational secondary programs to where everyone is working off of the same base issues. You still have to separate seventh and eighth graders from high school kids, and that's a security and safety issue. But from an academic point of view, there's many things that can be shared of where eighth grade teachers might be teaching ninth grade courses, ninth grade teachers, I don't know if I'm doing this short, I don't know. Uh, ninth grade teachers may be teaching down, so you create efficiency of your education staff and you put them on one campus, okay? All right, this is where it gets fun and confusing, and I'll try to start in a summary way of, of the different options that we have identified of how you might best organize your district and what are the financial consequences of that. First off, I can tell you, money is not unlimited. You can't have everything you want. If the district did everything that was needed in this district, it would be well over $150 million worth of needs. You can't come up with $150 million. Your bonding capacity is around $33, $34 million if you choose to pass a bond issue. Uh, you've got some other flexible variations of what can be added to that, but in, in the range of the middle 30 billions is the maximum the district could come up with in a, a funding for capital facilities. On the far left is the list of all of your schools. The first option that we always study is what do you do if you fix everything that you've got of your existing buildings? And that's the column labeled existing. So it's not changing grades, it's not changing anything, it's just fixing all of the building needs that are on those campuses. And that costs $43 million. So if the board chooses to do that, they can do that. But then we'd have to start setting priorities within that structure because you can't come up with $43 million. You would have to decide what is most important and pare that down to a prioritized list and fix what you've got. There's nothing wrong with that option. It's not necessarily what's best educationally for your 
your students and your community, but it is a valid option and certainly worth talking about. The next option is a new high school. Because for years, ever since the whole issue of consolidation came up, the whole many, many people said, well, let's build a new high school in this community. We deserve a new 9 through 12 high school, or 7 through 12. So I ran the numbers of what would that take. And it takes $84 million district-wide to do that, to fix your existing buildings. It's right at $47 million to build a new high school, and that doesn't even count site athletics. So that tells me really quick that, that you cannot afford that option. But I did study it because it was a valid consideration, and, and I knew people wanted to have that discussion. I know there's people that are going to say, that's a padded number and you've lost your friggin' mind. I'm telling you it's based on fact. This is all I do with schools in the state of Mississippi. I've got hard numbers on what schools cost in construction all across the state, and these are real numbers based on real experiences of what's going on in schools today. So, although a nice idea, it's not something you can afford to think about. That gets us to options, the, the last two options, which I'm calling options four and five, and they are prioritized list of the organizational option that we have suggested. And there's clearly two differences in them. Uh, the elementaries are, are very similar in each of the options, and let me kind of talk about those first. At Baylor or Pyramid, you could do either option. You could make one central office for administration and the other one pre-K and K for all of the students other than the magnet schools. It's a flip of the coin of cost. Uh, either one would work either way, and there, there's no positive or negative necessarily. So this is just a flexible deal. At the end, Smith, we're recommending it as a third and fourth grade school. Bell and Hayes Cooper would remain K through six. Parks Elementary would become a first and second grade school. Pyramid or Naylor would repeat pre-K or K, pre-K and K, depending on which one you choose to do. This existing building would become the fifth and sixth grade school for the entire district except the two magnet schools. So it would be the higher of the elementary grades, Obviously, this has been a high school, so bigger kids fit well into this existing building, uh, and that's in option four. Also in option four, the existing high school, central high school, will become a 7th through 12th campus. The main difference between the two options is where do the 7th through 12th graders go? So in option five, you see that this campus becomes your 7th through 12th campus. And it's a great idea. Here's the difference between the two. One costs 37 million and one costs 47 million. Because the buildings are not the same. This campus is smaller, both its site and its square footage of classrooms. So it takes more work to make this a 7th through 12th campus than it does to make the other campus. That's the reason we were recommending that the existing high school campus be the 7th through 12th school. It's not saying east side is any better or worse, it's just smaller and not efficient, not economical to put all of those kids on this campus. Also, your athletic facilities have already been developed to a certain degree at the other campus, which makes it more affordable. Either option, we would be improving athletics in the site scenario. Spending about $5.8 million, and I'll talk about specifics of that here in a minute. So at this point, as a consulting company, we're recommending option four. Uh, I wanted you to see option five because it came up as an issue in the last community meeting of why, why are we not putting seven through 12 here? The reason is it costs $10 million more. Next slide. So real quick, real quick summary, keeping the back of schools as they are and fixing them. Reorganizing your elementary so that every kid goes to every school with the exception of the magnets. Repurposing Naylor or Pyramid for central office or pre K and K. Renovating this building as a five and six grade upper elementary. And at the high school, you would renovate the existing building, just like we are at all the other buildings, but with some significant 
uh, differentiation. The gym needs some significant work for a high school of that size, so we need some locker room renovations uh, and some gym seating renovations, as well as all the other mechanical, electrical, site needs, etc. And then there will be a major addition, and I'm going to show you what that might look like here in a second. But that major addition would consist of new classrooms and science labs to accommodate the number of students, keeping 7th and 8th grade in the older building, and 9th and 12th in the uh, newer building plus additions, building a new cafeteria, cafetorium, building a new media center, and new improvements and additions to all of the fine arts facilities, band, course, drama, etc. On the site athletics, uh, at all of the facilities there, there would be a new artificial turf and a new track placed at the football stadium, which you can play soccer on as well. New lights, LED lights, and a jumbotron scoreboard. Bleacher renovations, renovating baseball and softball, they're not near as difficult to shape, and we would need to do some work to each of those facilities. And then renovating the existing administration building as a field house for site athletics. So you're not throwing away perfectly good buildings, you're using them for different functions. And location wise, I would work very well. Okay, next. This is an overall site plan of the high school campus as it currently exists. Uh, the road is on the bottom. In the lower right hand corner is the existing older building where we would put 7th and 8th graders. On the left, you see the gym in the middle and the classroom wings, all of which would be expanded. The blue rectangles that you see are new classrooms that would be added on the front of the building, not just for efficiency, but also to improve the aesthetics of the building. And that's one of the things that's really identified in, in many of your buildings, but your, this is going to be your flagship high school. Image is important. When you're doing economic recruitment in your community, see what your high schools look like and we think it needs to be improved to do that. There would be a new administrative area in the middle. The green circle would be where the commons and cafeteria would be and where the media center would be. There's also there's also room for a future secondary gymnasium uh, as funds well become available. That's the rectangle just above the circle. Okay, next. This is what we think that might look like. Uh, this would be the new administrative entry and entry into the entire campus. Every visitor that enters this 7th through 12th grade school would come through a secure lobby and be allowed into the remaining portions of the building. So that, that becomes the image of the front door of the school. You'll see on the right behind the flagpole is where we're recommending the commons and cafeteria. And you'll see classroom buildings on the left. Uh, of the administrative area. Yeah. Okay, next. Sorry. Next. Sorry. This is the interior of the Commons cafeteria area. Again, these are very preliminary ideas, uh, but just showing what can be. These are not final designs by any means. We just wanted to show what capacities uh, could be done at the campus and let you see what kind of images could be done. Uh, you're competing with schools all across the state of the function and an image, and these will be ways of improving them. And one more. This is a bird's eye view of the stadium just to show new turf, new graphics, new track, new jumbo tribe, etc. A lot of work and study would have to go into that, of course. Okay, next. All right, so what do you do next? And the board's got to decide at some point what they're going to do. These are our recommendations, but there's flexibility in every one of them that can be refined and developed based on what the board's desire is. But that's what we're recommending. The main goals is to focus on education. Don't do buildings just for building sake. Improve buildings to improve education. Create equity across all of your schools and invest in education for your children. It does require a bond issue. And a short version of that is bond issue requires 60% of the people who vote to pass it. The board chooses to do that. Uh, it's nothing more than an election. It's run by the school district, so it requires people to get out and vote. 
and you have to have 60% to do it. It's not a simple majority. Uh, but that would involve your bond council and uh, your local council to, to run that election, and it's not nothing but a political process. Um, very quickly through that, I would be glad to answer any questions or throw things at me if you need to.
There's no bad questions. I always encourage if you want to follow up with a question to your superintendent, uh, believe me, he has my cell number, so uh, he, he will pass them on to me, and I will be glad to get any responses back to you. In you know, short version, my job is to serve you and to give you the best school district you can afford as a community. It's not my decision, it's the school board's decision of, of what do you do. I'm trying to show you what your building needs are. Many of these things are basic data. It's what does it take to fix what you've got. Yes, if you're building new construction, you can make it aesthetically nicer than what you have. But most of this is infrastructure work. And, and, and I want to stress one of the things I said up front. What do you do if you don't do it? it Y'all don't have to do a bond issue. You can keep doing what you're doing. What's going to happen is you're going to spend more and more of your operating budget to fix building needs because you have to have toilets at work. You have to have mechanical systems at work. And you have to have roofs that don't leak. So if you don't have a capital funding budget to do that, and that's the primary way of funding large projects and bond issues, you start taking it out of your operating budget. Your operating budget is already shrinking, so that starts to impact education. Yes, sir. Inside the Mississippi Delta, well, inside the Mississippi Delta, is there any other towns that study with this that's presented a bond issue that is becoming successful and what they're doing? There's not a current district that's looking at a bond issue. Legal and past one last year that we're involved in is much smaller because it's a much smaller district, about a 6.9 million. Uh, DeSoto County is fixing the plan one, but I don't know really count that as part of the Delta. I'm just wondering how a bond issue Well, it's, it's, it's a financial issue, it's a political issue that you have to decide whether you're going to fund to take care of your buildings. They're going to fall down if you don't. And I hate to be so crude, uh, but there, there are places in the state that choose not to do it and, and they're closing buildings because theirs are almost going much worse. Uh, yours, 10% is not shocking compared to some of the places we're working. So it's, uh, it's, it's something you got to take care of what you've got, I guess is the short version. Yes, ma'am. At the last meeting, you said that the maximum line capacity was at 15%. It's going to be 30.9 million. So where do we get the other 7 million? That's a, that's a district decision meeting with the bond council. Uh, you've got three bill notes. You've got lease options. You've got fund balance. There's several things that can be discussed to get there. That's the decision the board had made. They may not choose to spend 37 million. What we've shown costs 37 million. It could always be pared down. You know, when you're setting priorities, that's not everything that needs to be done. That's a first priority list. So it could be cut back and everybody's got to live within the budget. So that decision has to be made by the district. Good question. Yes, ma'am. But you are. But I am. Okay. we're having with the board is that once the board decides yes we're interested in the concept of a bond issue there's a lot of things like that that have to be done uh, we typically recommend that it's roughly a 60-day process of public relations and information setting for what what it takes for people to see what the needs are and to be informed before they vote so you don't just say one board meeting we want a bond issue and the next board meeting you do it it's usually scheduled out, so hypothetically, if the community decides in February you're going to have a bond issue, you could easily do one in April. Uh, we always recommend having bond issues while school is in session so that you're dealing with uh, public perception of kids. You're dealing with children, and it's uh, parents are obviously not on vacation if you do it while school. 
So it's either in the late spring or early fall are the best times to do bond issues. The issue of the 24-month schedule is real. So if you wait till fall to do a bond issue, you're going to end up not finishing the high school project in time for August of 23. square footage wise to create a 9 through 12 high school and when you use current cost per square foot to accommodate that it's 47 million dollars. Well as I said in my previous meetings I'm told again good money for old material like this. This room can clean my I understand. I've driven the front of clean my house, I've driven the back of clean my house. It is an old school. Yes sir. You put, you upgrade to the auditorium Well, let, let me address one. It should be about what the best interest of our kids. I strongly agree. We should not be able to put a money for dollar bank. We should be able to stay at our school so our kids will be happy to come to school and get a quality education. Well, let, let, let me deal with one reality because I 100% agree with you that is the best thing for this community if you could afford it. So here's the reality. That, the let, let me finish. I'll let you finish. If you spent $37 million, and if you could afford to build a new school for $37 million, you would spend zero on these other buildings. And they would fall apart. You have said that several times. My only point is, we can do what we want to do. We could, we could build a school if we decide to build a school. I, I, I just don't believe we can. I think if we value our children like we say we value, all you got to do is go around the state of Mississippi, every small town building, state of the art, state of the art. All you got to do is go, go and see. It's no, I, I'm, I'm working in over half of them. I see them. What? I work in over half of them, so I know what it is, and I know what their tax base is and what the, the capacity of raising dollars. That's all I can do is tell you the truth based on, on data. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you also have renderings, or has the school district paid you to do renderings for the elementary schools based on aesthetic needs, interior needs? Do you well, have renderings of those? The, well, there's not any renderings to talk about mechanical and roofing systems. There, there's no additions needed at the elementary schools. There's vast capacity to handle the academic programs. So it's fixing the interior of those buildings. It's painting, it's toilet renovations, it's things that don't show up in a rendering. The, the 7 through 12 campus would be the only one with substantial additions. That's the only reason we did renderings. District didn't pay me to do it, by the way. Yes, ma'am. Have you factored in the option of schools raising money for those facilities themselves through grants or other sure. methods? I mean, just speaking as a parent who's involved in her school, we have sought out grants and reached out to local businesses and have an active booster club that has tried to offset costs to the district by absorbing them on our own. Right. So that so that our teachers, so that it doesn't affect what happens in the classroom. Have you considered that in your I have and I, I apologize for digressing for a second. I've been a PTA president. You know, my kids attended public schools and I worked like many of you to raise money just like we all do with our kids. The dollars that you're talking about are wonderful for small projects, minor technology, playgrounds, things like that. The, the ability to raise enough money to do a substantial capital project is very seldom doable by parents and kids. Now grants, I would love to tell you that there's a panacea. If you've got Bill Gates cell number, I'll be glad to call him. But my experience is foundations and large corporations are not buying facilities. They're putting money into academic programs. So I, that's just been my experience. I do understand that, but if you have enough, I'm not talking about, well, 
the large upgrades. Um, you know, you mentioned toilets. Yeah. Like there are there are things available out there for those kind of upgrades. Well, and anything you can do to raise community money offsets that cost and is a positive deal. It doesn't get you $10 million to, you know, to afford a new high school. A toilet renovation is $40,000 because there's such serious needs. So every time you can raise $40,000, you renovate a toilet, and that saves money. That's a great thing. But that goes back to the priority setting is that your list is so long that I would love to see you do some of those other renovations that need to be done, and we've tried to prioritize them on the bond issue list. Other question? Yes, sir. On schools that are losing 10% of students a year. Five years here. Or over five years. They have taken out a significant bond issue like you're proposing to us. What kind of increase in their students have you seen in return? Uh, it's a fair it's question. One. And then number two, with the significant construction that you're suggesting uh, on the front of old, you know, Cleveland Central High School, um, how much does it accommodate future growth so we don't, you know, we're not just building that capacity, but right. we're building for the future? The, the capacity is always a fair issue. You, you have to plan for the what ifs if it if it came back and started growing. And we've tried to look at an eight to 10% growth margin if it ever happened. That 8% is, is minor when you start looking at the number of classrooms that are needed. You also have capacity within your numbers of kids per classroom because many of your classes are not 24 and 25 kids per class. In high school level, they're down in the 18 to 20s. So you have growth capacity by adding kids per class. The, the, the questions about declining enrollment and being able to afford it is, is a tax question. And the bond council will be running numbers of what is the tax impact on typical taxpayers uh, for, you know. For, I'm not asking that necessarily. I'm asking what have you seen on return and investment? All right, return on investment. It's a fair question. Do, do kids come back? Yeah. Rarely does it happen. You wouldn't want me to sit here and lie to you. There are some communities where they may have lost uh, white kids for white flight, and you might get some of them back. You might have kids that have done homeschooling, who you might get some of them back. My experience from a de demographic point of view is it's not going to change the reality of a declining enrollment. Every, every kid you get money for, so it's a good thing to get them back, but it's not going to save the day until the economy rapidly, radically changes in this community. You have to have tax base. And that's where jobs are, and that's why people are typically live where they live. When they, when they don't have a job, they're going to move their kids. And that's what's happened in the Mississippi Delta, in my experience. Yes, ma'am. Do you all have copies of the rendering of the drawings? Uh, Dr. Belcher has that in a PDF, and I, he can distribute that out. Sure. Yeah, we've got all of the details broken down. I, I th my advice to the board is they need to decide on a direction, not necessarily a final decision, because we haven't decided whether Naylor or Pierman is going to be the central office. So finalizing some of those minutia dollars, I've got them broken down to the nth degree, and once the board you know, wants to publish that, I, I can do it. Uh, every school, every piece of renovation, it's in my study. I can't hear you speak up. I said I don't think they should take now the elementary school because the elementary school was just fixed. So why would you take the money that we've already put in that one school and then change it again? So I think they need to think about what they're going to do. First you say you're going to just use the money for the high school kids. You're going to do, you're going to change the central office. Well, I think it should be for the kids. If we're going to deal with one school, let's just deal with one school. They put money over at the elementary school across the street. What are we going to do with that? They can build it over there. All right. There's money for every facility. This is not just a 7 through 12 high school proposal. 
in, in that list, we've got dollars recommended to improve every facility based on its need. Some of them have roof problems, some of them have mechanical, almost all of them have toilets. All of them need painting, so there's money being spent at every school. And we've got them all broken down, yes ma'am. That's, that's a district decision. It's, it's a draft form right now, and if you choose to me to do a summary document, I can certainly you know, publicize that. But Right now, we're presenting to you ideas and preliminary reports. And, and my understanding is the board wanted to hear your opinions. Communities make decisions. Three out of five board members ultimately have to make a decision. Okay, any other questions for me? I know y'all have other things. Yes, ma'am. Can I correct that if Central Office goes to Naylor, the pre-K goes to Beerman? Yes. Okay, so they just decide. Yeah, it's either or. But you are planning on keeping all the pre-K. That I'm I'm not keeping anything. Uh, <laughs> I'm leaving when y'all talk pre-K, okay? We're, facility wise, we're planning for the pre-K that you have. Funding, that's another issue beyond me. Okay, thank you very much. You asked very, very good questions and uh, it's, it's thrilling to see this many people come out to talk about public schools. Uh, public makes up public schools and I appreciate y'all being here and thank you for having me. Have a good evening. Can I leave? Yeah. I hope everyone got a chance to uh, listen and uh, see what Mr. Bailey was presenting. I think this was our third meeting that we have done pertaining to this. So they get a little bit more detailed every time. So we'll have more details on our next one. And um, please don't hesitate to ask questions or email questions to the central office, uh, to the board members as well. Um, at the end, I always give the updates of the district. There are a few things that um, <coughs> I'm going to address tonight as soon as they get it up. Um, but while they're getting it up, I'll, I'll say um, we have a good question to answer as a community, as a school district. If nothing is done, then what do we do? Uh, the leaks do not go away. The flooding does not stop. Nothing stops. So if we do not pass a bond, what are we going to do? That is something that we really have to think about. Are you ready now? Yeah. So I always start with our mission, vision, values, and our fundamentals. This is crucial to what we do every day. You got to have a mission, you got to have a vision, and you got to have goals. Um, we talked to all the schools and all the leaders in the schools, and we developed this as a team. No one person developed this. Next one. We have four goals, student achievement, positive culture, community engagement, and employee retention. We felt that all four of those were vital for a school district and a public to come together, a community to come together and make all anything happen. It's just gonna take some time a lot of time. Sometimes we do not wanna give time any time. So today, tonight, participants will receive information regarding district updates, academic status of the district, enrollment trends, budget updates, and community contribution opportunities. District updates. All right, district of innovation application has been completed. This took a while for us to get this completed. Um, what we're trying to do within our district of innovation, um, we're planning to do our first career academy next year. Our first career academy will be education and health. I think that'll be our first one, first career academy. And we also are planning for a virtual middle college. All of this is in our district, our innovation. So what is middle college? The whole goal is for our kids to have an associate's degree by the time they graduate. So they start this in 11th grade and they have an associate's degree by the time they graduate high school. So this is pretty neat. We're working with Mississippi Delta with this action. Um, planning for a hybrid high school for next year. Hybrid means the same way that we're going to school now as far as 
Some, some classes are on, online, some classes are face-to-face. -face. Even when the pandemic is over, that's the way we want the school to run. We want the school to run that way all the time. That is a pretty neat way, pretty good way, and we found out that a lot of kids like the schedule as well. So it'll run similar to a college schedule, but it'll be really, really important in all those tested subject areas. After talking to Mr. Foster, he really believes that they should come to the campus for that, but it's been really good. Uh, devices are still arriving. We still don't have all of our devices. We ordered our devices in May, I think it was May. We, we're getting them in on the pallets. We're tagging them and bagging them. We're doing everything we need to do to make sure we get a good inventory. We're also ordering a whole bunch of other electrical things. I don't see one in here, but we replaced all the routers in every building. That was an upgrade. Um, we increased the bandwidth. We were at one gig of bandwidth, but now we're at five gigs, which is the most that you can get. And uh, we replaced all the switches and everything to make the internet run faster. You can't have all the good stuff as far as devices and your infrastructure is not good. It's just gonna bog down. Next one, yeah. Multiple partnerships. Not only do we partner with Delta State, we do Mississippi Delta Community College, and we have a new one with William Carey. So we're doing some things with William Carey as well. Um, with our teacher, um, our teacher program at the um, CTE, Ms. Mitchell and Mr. Foster's working together, doing a really, really good job to try to get this going as well. Uh, state has suspended letter grades for the 2021 school year, but you must take the assessment. So what that means, we're going to take the test. You're going to, we're going to take the test, but they're not going to count it against us, but they're going to publish it. So they're gonna really publish this in the paper, even if you did bad. So we're still working as if this is gonna count. Very, very hard. The principals are doing a really good job. It's just been a challenge with all the quarantines that we have to do. Not a lot of positive cases within the schools. We just have a lot of close contact quarantines. So I think we have a system in place. Every school has a good system. Also, Superintendent Advisory Committee. This has been fun. We have some people in here that's on the committee. Dr. Davis is on the committee, that Ms. Flynn is on the committee. We got a few people that's on the committee. We're trying to create something called Adopt a School for the next school year. So this year's the planning for it, next year's the actual go get it. So that's gonna take some time. It's gonna be really good. Uh, we're working on an application for businesses um, to contribute to our Adopt a School, that they can adopt a school and say, and the principals are gonna say, these are the things that I need, and they select, the businesses select what they want to do. We're not only looking for money, we're looking for time as well. So you can adopt a school with time and not just money. Also, uh, awaiting application to renew early learning collaborative program for 21-22. We have two schools that's in the early learning collaborative right now, which is Parks and Naylor. So we're gonna revamp our early learning collaborative application to say Bell and Hayes Cooper. We're gonna put those two in the early learning collaborative. But right now we only have two schools in the early learning collaborative. We met with MDE last week, talked through everything to make sure we were good to go. They said yes. The only issue they said, they said you're good with the early learning collaborative, but we do not know how much money you're going to get. That's what they told me. So they said they won't know how much money they're gonna get until April or May. So right now we have Parks and Naylor are in the Early Learning Collaborative. And to let you know how that works, hold on, and let you know how that works, we have to match the funds. They give us a certain amount of money. They gave us $225,000 this year, but we had to match the funds, which is in kind. When you're in the Early Learning Collaborative, that's all you get. We only got $225,000. And you can, there are different indicators that you can use this money for. Salaries, benefits, there are like six or seven things I think on the side that you can use it for. So we're gonna revamp our program for next year and it's gonna be really good. It's more detail, hold on. Uh, awaiting amount of ESSA two and guidance. We got our ESSA one money. The stuff we got, the stimulus money, how we got all the computers and all that stuff? Well, we're gonna get another round of money for that too. We just don't know how much and we don't know when. 
So they haven't given us any guidance. Uh, federal programs has been in a few meetings, and it's going to be really good. We got plans for it. Uh, I don't know if you've been researching it, but some of the stuff says something about clean air, uh, learning loss, and, and some other things in there, too, that we're, we've already written down what we want to do. It's going to be really good. We just got to get all the guidelines and know exactly how much money that we can spend. When you get this money, you can't just spend the money on what you want. You have to spend it on what they say you can spend it on. Even, it doesn't matter how much money it is. Next one, Leo. All right, academic status. One time. All right, I wanted to show you this. This right here is how you get a grade in a school, okay? That's the chart, not a chart made by us. This is the chart that the state goes by, okay? You have height, you have elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, okay? We have a weird school in our accountability. And I'll tell you, our weird school is Naylor. Naylor is a pre-K two school. Naylor does not take a state test. Did everybody know that? Naylor does not take a state test, but Naylor gets a grade. So how does Naylor get their grade? Naylor gets their grade because DM Smith is their sister school, their feeder school. So Naylor's proficiency comes from DM Smith's third grade. Naylor's growth comes from DM Smith's fourth grade. So when you see that grade in the paper, that grade is not really depicting on Naylor's children taking the exam. One more time, Neil. All right, the curtain has, has it up there. All right, all the schools you see in purple, all the schools you see in purple, they are your 700 schools. Your high schools are your 1,000 point schools. So if you look by rank, our top performing school is Hayes Cooper at a 555, that's an A. Our second highest school is the high school at 621, they are C. Our next school is Parks at 328, they are C. The school after that is Bell at a 309, they are D. DM Smith next, 297 is a D. The middle school is at 292, it's a D. Naylor is at 286, that's a D. Pyramid is at a 271, and that's a D. At this point, we have five D schools, two C schools, and one A school. That's where we are. Five D schools, two C schools, one A school. And one of those schools on that list doesn't even take a test. That's Naylor. So what I really want you to pay attention to also are the cuts. If you see Pyramid at 271, if you go over to the 700 point scale, to be an F, you have to score a 268 and below. So they're right there on that line. If you look at Parks, they're at a 328. To make a C, you have to score a 328. One more point and Parks will be a D. And that would mean that we have six D schools. Uh, we haven't taken a state exam since um, 2018, 2019. We didn't take a state exam last year, and we're gonna take it this year, but you're not gonna get a score. So what I'm, I'm showing you this where we are, because many people are worried about the, the children that are in the high school and the middle school. That, that is true, but all of our kids are taking a learning loss. You've had a learning loss since, it's gonna be, for some kids, it's gonna be a year and a quarter. Because that last nine weeks last year, that's a quarter then. Some people are all, all virtual for this whole year. So there is going to be a learning loss. And it's going to hit us if we do not do something different. We're going to have to do something different. Uh, scheduling is going to be very important for everybody in every school district. Because you're going to have to soak up that loss. Not while only school is in, but when school is out. As far as to say, I say school is out when everybody takes the test. Because after I take the test, I can really focus on the things I need to focus on. Hit it one time for me. Enrollment trends. Someone asked, and it was a good question. These are the enrollment trends, from, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it was. Up here you have 2013, 14, all the way to 2021 for the district. In 1314, the district population was 3,821 kids. 
1415 was 3,741. In 1516, it was 3,652. 2016-17 was 3,565. 1718, 3,400. 1819, 3,399. 1920, 3,352. 2021, 2968. There is a steady decline of children that we're losing. Our population is dwindling. After meeting with the mayor and talking about the city's population as well, the city of Cleveland's population is dwindling. Next one, Neil. So someone asked, how does it look by school? So the light purple block, that's 1314. The dark purple is 2021. So in 13-14, Bell had 356 kids. 2021, they have 348. Hayes Cooper in 13-14 had 378 children. Hayes Cooper now has 282 children. Naylor, 13-14, had 369 children. 2021, 242 children. Parks in 13-14 had 389. 2021, is 238. Pierman, 1314, had 265 children. 2021, they have 205. DM Smith, 1314, had 361 children. 2021, 345. The middle school in 1314 had 479 kids. In 2021, they have 510. The high school in 1314 had 924. Now they have 798. There is a steady decline. Um, right now, the only school up there that's, that has an increase, and keep in mind, DM Smith, the middle school and the high school were established in 1718, not 1314. That's why I have the star beside it. It's 1718. So the only school that has an increased enrollment right now from third, for the last few years is the middle school. The middle school is the only one that has the increased enrollment. Hit it for me. All right. District's yearly pre-K enrollment. As a district, we have a yearly average. We have an average of 89.75 children in pre-K. 89.75. Right now, we have seven sites of pre-K. We only have one third grade class, and that's at Hayes Cooper. So, in 13, 14, we had 91. 14, 15, we had 90. 15, 16, 78. 16, 17, 83. 17, 18, 83. 18, 19, 80. 19, 20, 115. 20, 21, 98. That brings us to an average of 89.75. The plan that we are, of, of, we, ha we, have, we are creating will have a number the number of kids that will be in the pre-K will be 80. I don't know who's told you all that we were going to get rid of pre-K, period. No one ever said that. Give me a minute. No one ever said it. Never said we were getting rid of pre-K. Said we were revamping it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to revamp it. Um, Mr. Luciano, myself, Mr. Evans, Jamie Jacks, Jim Key, and the state auditor had a meeting yesterday. Mr. Luciano, could you elaborate on the meeting? Sure. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. For those that don't know me, I'm Ron Luciano. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. I get it. I totally get it. I know why a lot of you are here. You're ready to crucify the board. You're ready to jump on the district. I've seen the comments, I've seen the emails. I have a little bit of patience. What Dr. Belcher did was recognize that there was an issue with the formula, with the funding, with what we were doing. He raised the issue to the state auditor's office, to the attorney general's office, to Jim Key. If you don't know who Jim Key is, he is the preeminent lawyer in Mississippi in school for law. School law. He raised the issue with them, self-reported to say, we have an issue, we recognize. 
We need to fix it. So while everyone's out there typing on the keyboards, while the school district's going down, we're trying to kill it. Trust your board members. That's why you elect them. We looked at the early morning collaborative. Take a look at that. That has a lot of requirements. That has a lot of different things that must be done. One of the general things is you can't mix state tax dollars and private money. When we recognized things were going on, we called ourselves on it. So I can tell you now, the pre-K will be here, revamped, according to law, according to the MDE, according to the Early Learning Collaborative. It's not a rash decision that you think might have been made. It looks that way. It's pretty easy to think that way. Hopefully you guys can trust the process. If you don't, that's okay. Talk to your board members. Go talk to Dr. Belcher. Come talk to me if you want to. We need the law part of it in there, yes. We're working with the state auditor's office. We're working with the attorney general's office. This will be here next year. One thing that I have heard in mind is that, man, this is going on in somewhere else. This is going on in Oxford. They're doing it over there. They're doing it in Jackson. Are they doing it legally? I don't know. But I can tell you that other school districts are being looked at. It's better that we address this on the front end now and get it fixed and get it done the right way, as opposed to having someone come in and report us and then us having to address it. I can tell you now, the pre-K program will be here next year. What, what was one of the oh, wait. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Les, Les yeah. come see me. It's a lot of, uh, I wish I could take anybody come see me. I wish I could take, what I can tell you is that it's partially in regards to funding. What? Can you mix state funds? It's that easy. Can I mix state funds? with private dollars. Has that been happening? Yes. No. 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 <laughs> in certain you situations, can't do that. you can. In the early learning class, Todd, if you don't believe me, that's great. Now, forgive me, Dr. Davis. If you don't believe me, that's great. Dr. Come Dr. with me. Before. Can you do it? Yes. Are other school districts doing it? Yes. Did we establish it and have it successfully run? Yes. And now we're not doing it. It doesn't make any sense. And that's why I say, come see me so I can explain I think it to you. We're all here right now. Because there are other issues that need to be addressed yeah. with the state auditor, with the attorney general. Are you, That's what we're doing now. Are you involving the program itself in this discussion? The program? Like the, the programs that are supposedly illegal, are you involving them in the conversation? Yes. This is all coming to fruition. We're trying to fix this. That's the best I can do. Without coming here and sitting here and spending three hours going, here's the ELC, here's the, what we have, here's what we don't have. I'm trying to shortline this to say, trust the process. If you don't, then that's fine, Dr. Davis. You and Les and whomever, let's go sit down somewhere. I'll explain it to you so then you can go, okay, now I get it. I think that's what we came here for, all, out of all due respect. I understand it's a difficult job, it's a difficult situation, but you, you, you're using a pronoun that doesn't have an antecedent. You're saying it, but we don't know what it is. 3K. Okay, okay. That's the problem. Tell me about it. 3K is the problem. Okay. The problem is exactly what he just said. We're mixing state funds with donated funds. Can I, can I have it? Sure. The issue is, first off, Hayes, Cooper, and Bell is not in the collaborative. There's only Naylor and Parks. Let's get that straight first. I do have a question. Why is Bell listed on the MDE website as a collaborative site? I, I have no clue because we met with the head of the ELC and they told us that Naylor and Parks are in the Early Learning Collaborative, the head of the ELC. So I have no clue. I only get, let me finish. So 
The problem is the pre-K. We are intermingling monies from the tuition and state funding. The tuition that is being paid does not cover that program at all. The tuition that is being paid does, right now with the number of children does not even cover one teacher. In that classroom, there's a teacher, there's a teacher assistant, and there's resources. You're looking at over hundred plus thousand dollars to make that classroom work. We are not collecting that much money at all. So that means the district has to kick in money and you can't do that. Where did that come from? The state auditor, not us. That's why. So we're getting an opinion from the AG. As Arnold has said, himself and Jamie, they're really looking into some other things that they found and we have to present something to the AG. So the AG can tell us it's a yay or nay. So we're waiting. They're composing that, they started composing that today. We met with them yesterday. So that is the issue. As, as I was saying before, we will have pre-K. I don't know why everybody thought that we were getting rid of pre-K. I never ever said that. Let me get finished. Let me tell you how it goes for me. I never get in front of the board, ever. I always tell them first. After I tell them, I tell the schools, the principals and whomever is dealing with. Then I tell the public. We did not start doing this and telling everybody. I told the board at a board meeting, we were talking about it. The other, not this Friday, this Friday that just passed, Friday before last, we told people and that was involved. The plan was to present this to the community tonight, but no one never gave me a chance. I never had a chance. So nothing is being touched in three days at all. Four four three, right? This this is the this is what we're doing. I, I was about to get there. About to get there. Okay. This is we have a plan. We do not know how much the early learning collaborative is going to be, especially when we, we're going to tweak it. Like I said before, Naylor and Parks are in there. We're going to take them out and we're going to put Bell and Hayes Cooper in there. Why? Because the enrollment is so low. So we talked with the people at the ELC. They said that's a really good idea. That is because the enrollment is low. So we would have waiting on the ELC to see how much money we're going to get. Two classes at Bell. How many classes does Bell have right now? Two classes at Bell. Two classes at Hayes Cooper. That that is the plan. We pending ELC money. No. No. That's what we're trying to find out. And if they say yes, if they say you can have it, but you cannot intermingle money, which means that that program has to, has to run itself. That means you gotta have enough money coming in as a tuition to cover a teacher, teacher assistance. These are not things I'm making up. Lights, lunches, hold on, um, resources. You're looking at a hundred plus thousand dollars that you got to have if they say yes for this 3K. You got to have at least, so the $440 tuition, if you had four, if you had $440 tuition and you had 20 children in those classes for a whole year of school, that's $88,000. That's not enough money. You're going to have to bump the tuition up. Depends on how many children are in there because you still got to make a certain number. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. All right. Here's my concern, and I'm looking at these numbers, and you've got 2021 up there, and we all know that 2021 is an anomaly because of COVID, and those numbers seem very drastic. And on a lot of these slides, you're comparing 2013 to just 2021. It would be really nice to see those numbers compared to 19 and 20. However, your average up here is 90 students. We're talking about 90 students in four classrooms, maxed out 
in 20, which is not an ideal for anybody. Uh -huh. And you're saying that it's a cost benefit. Those kids, you're talking about at minimum 10 kids with no option if you do that. That's not true. Because, because in the early learning collaborative, you are collaborating with a Head Start. With a Head Start. You collaborate with a Head Start. So we've already talked to the Head Start, and they are elated. They are excited because they have the room. They need the children. It's not a free kindergarten program. It is not the same. Okay. And, and I'm telling you, you're going to have families, and they are going to leave the public school system. You say 10 kids leave the public school system in 4K. They're not coming back. And then you're losing out on those students from kindergarten all the way through. And if that's $5,000 per student, you're talking about $50,000 each year. And if you're just doing elementary school, you're talking $350,000 that the school district, we're being told, is hemorrhaging students. And now you're not willing to invest in these programs that there's, there is funding out there for. And you and I spoke on Tuesday night. My name is Sayward Fortner. And when I called you last Tuesday, when I first got here, I'm glad to meet you. You told me that you would have two classrooms. You said there would be one at Hayes Cooper and one at Bell. Those were the words out of your mouth. And then you also said, if you can tell me where to get a million dollars, I'll be happy to help you. That is not an adequate response. It is not my job as a parent to go find the money. It is your job to go out there and find the funding. And if there is funding out there, we check all the boxes in the area that we are in. We, are, we have the need. So there is funding out there for these babies. And Head Start is not the answer. And we have two programs that have proven to work. And we're cutting them off at the need. And, there has, and I have a real issue with you coming in and presenting this and then going to administrators, telling them that this is the case, and then when it gets out, trying to make everything sound like you, you were ahead of the game. I was. That's not the case. I was. Your response to me last Tuesday sounded nothing like what is happening now. Well, you never gave me a chance. You cut me off. I Yes, ma'am. And on Monday, and none of this was ever elaborated on. As I said before, you never gave me a chance to. I can get to the end of it. Budget. Yes, ma'am. Is what happened to Hayes Cooper and Bell is, has something to do with the other part that's going on now? What's the other part? Tell me. Uh-huh. Bell had become part of the magnet school. Is the problem still the same? It's stated, well, let me stop. Okay. Okay, enough African American children were not in pay school. Okay. So they cut the funding there because it was more Caucasian. Tell people what's going on. Is it because the way the numbers are in the school system? Oh no. Um, Hayes Cooper Hayes Cooper and with yeah. what's going on. Hayes, based on the money. Hayes yeah, Hayes Cooper and Bell has a good split of children okay. um, demographically. I know it went that way. Yeah, they have a really good split. So why are we I know Head Star is losing children because of the public school taking in more kids than they are. I know. But we have to get to the point to make it equal for all children. And huh? I'm not talking about just my rights. It's about all children. It's about getting kids educated because Mississippi is already 50% behind in a lot of states. So why are we constantly arguing about what we're going to do? Find a solution and make it work. You know, when, the, when our kids go off to college now, they, they think that they are A students. But when they get in, in another school yeah. setting, they actually come to be C and D students because the kids up north are learning much more and much faster than our kids. Stop competing with the race. We all, all kids got to learn. I agree with that. So find a solution. Next one, Neil. 
right there. All right. All the way, Neil. Keep going, keep going. Right there. Right, one more. All right. To look at the um, budget, it says we have a decrease in enrollment for 2021. Um, we're not the only school district that's had a drastic decrease this year. There are plenty of school districts around the state that are adjusting because they had so many kids that they lost. Uh, we were looking at the numbers today. I got a document today from MSBA, and I was looking at it. There's a district in the state that lost 2,000 children. Um, there's another district. DeSoto lost like almost 700. Everybody's losing children this year, and everybody's running around trying to adjust because it's going to greatly affect your budget for next year. If you look at ours, we have a decrease of 327 plus kids at around $5,200. That's how we come up with the $1.7 million. Your attendance, your enrollment and your attendance for the year prior affects your budget for the next year. That's how it works. And so no one knows what the state is going to do. Has no clue. Are we going to get a lot of ESSA money? Yes, we are. Can you hire people with this ESSA money? No, you cannot. There are, there are certain things that they're going to let you do with that money. One of the things is not personnel. So if you go through total estimated loss for the, uh, since 13-14, we've lost 853 students, which is equivalent to $4.4 million. We're losing children. To, this year was just a really big loss. Not only did we lose that ch those children, it's $1.7 million, at the last minute for this school year, MDE came to us and told us that your budget is going to be cut 1.6 million. So the school board in a session said, we're not going to let nobody go. It is too close to school to start. We're just going to take it out of our fund balance, which is our savings account. And that's what we did. We took the money out of our savings account. Now you all know in your own home savings account, if you keep taking money out of that savings account, you're not going to have any money left. And you're going to go, you're going to keep dwindling down. It's going to get lower and lower and lower and lower, and you're going to have nothing. We have a pretty decent fund balance, but we had to do some other projects this year as well that just popped out the blue. So there are some other things that with this ESSA money, I'm hoping that they will let us do. For example, they say clean air, right? We're trying to figure out a way to get everybody new HVAC because we can't do other stuff with the money. Those are rules that we have to work with. We need air, we need HVAC anyway, badly. We need windows, we need a whole bunch of stuff. It's just a tough deal for everybody in the state. So do we know what the budget is gonna be exactly? No, we do not. Do we need to prepare? Yes, we do. Because it is not moral for you to go to somebody in the month of May and tell them that they do not have a job and it's May. In the education field, that is very late because school is starting in August and most people got contracts out and they already got everybody hired. So that is tough. There's a lot of tough decisions. And if we do nothing, the buildings will crumble. I got three schools right now with three leaky roofs and a roof is not cheap. I got three leaky roofs. I got out here in the back of, of, of this school right here. If it rains really hard, go get your boat and you can ride around. It's major flooding. I've got electrical. So if, if the bond does not get passed, I, like you said, it is my responsibility to make sure that we have money. And that is exactly what I'm doing. I'm making sure we have the money because I am responsible for all the buildings. And I got to make sure all of these buildings are functioning correctly. I can't have a bunch of kids sitting in there and they're getting water dripped on them. Not on my watch. It just won't happen. Yes, ma'am. But I'm curious to know, how many assistant principals are there at the middle school now? And how many are there at the high school? One at the middle school, three at the high school. Okay. May I ask why? I'm sure there's an answer, but I'm just, I mean, when I was in high school, we didn't have, we had Paul Messer. <laughs> <laughs> you do, you need the assistant principals, especially at the high school. It's a lot of space to cover. It's a lot of 
you got to deal with the discipline that comes along with it. And at the middle school as well, stretching it for one, the middle school has around 500 some children, you need an assistant principal as a principal. Middle school is a lot of discipline. Yes, sir. Does the, uh, you mentioned with uh, high school, you're going to go to hybrid or continue a hybrid, and then that the uh, middle college option is going to be a virtual only option. Is that right? We're going to try to do it both ways. Yeah. So, I mean, we got Delta State in our back pocket. Yeah. You know? And so, my next question is Does that save us a significant amount of dollars on? Teachers, do you think? Is no. That, is, that, is that any part of that motivation? Is that no. a monetary thing, or do you think that's what's best for children? I do, because I think a lot of times in the school districts, we, we plan for a lower achieving children, but we don't plan for those high flyers a lot of times. Because to get in middle college, you're going to have to have ACT, a high, a high ACT, and all that stuff. Uh, and we're trying to just get them to get an associate's degree before they get out. It's, it's, it's good for the high flyers. I mean, it's good if you want to go to a public university. We, yeah. we have great public universities. Um, but, like, if you want to talk about high flight, I'm, I'm thinking more like advanced placement courses, international baccalaureate diploma program, yep. those kinds of things. Um, and we're offering AP. Yeah. We're offering AP. We're not an IB. But if you have middle college, it's going to be hard to sell AP. No. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've been there. <laughs> I, I taught. I've been there 13 years. The, the so, first year, we're not going to have that many in there. Yeah. Um, because it's not going to be of any charge to any of the children. So we figured out a way so that it's not a charge to the child. So we're not going to have many that first year. I, I, I it's going to be a small cohort, cohort. And then also, as far as quality instruction and learning is concerned, if you give a child a choice to be in front of a, a device, they're probably going to do that. Yeah. Right? And we're seeing more and more people suffering from emotional. Uh, the mental they, stress. They can't, they can't, they don't know how to have this conversation we're having right now. Yeah. And so, you know, the whole child is being left out of the equation when you have the option of a virtual only if you're middle college or a hybrid even. It just, it, it doesn't seem that that's the best for children. I'd mm -hmm. love if, if we could continue to talk about that as a district and let some, let you maybe hear some of us on some of the curriculum and instruction stuff. Understandable. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and just see what see what the district wants. Gotcha. Yeah. Can you go to the next one, Neil? How are we funded? State, local, federal, and 16th section. That's it. So there are different pots of money. Um, as we were talking to the state auditor the other day, they were talking about your local funds and your state funds and all that. This is our revenue. What happened to it? Oh, go back. Yeah. Right there, that's good. So how, how are they, when you get this money, the state gives you the money, you get local funds from your Avalorum and all of that, and then you get your federal dollars and you get your 16 section land. So I don't know if Mr. Wade is still here. Um, Mr. Wade is taking over our 16 section land, doing a phenomenal job, phenomenal. We are, we are finding a lot of things that Mr. Wade has gotten to help us with our 16 section land to uh, collect the leases. He's found a, a, a good number of, of leases that we had to get done that hadn't been got done in a minute, but we're good to go and we're getting that squared away. That helps us with our revenue. Federal funds, um, I really wanted to tell you about federal funds because when people hear you're hiring people or you're doing this with people, in a school, you have to understand how are these people getting paid. If I'm paying you through federal, that does not affect my, my regular budget. Has no effect on it. So whatever the state and the local gives me, the federal funds, it has nothing to do with that. So some of our teachers are hired through federal. The schools get their federal budgets. You don't want to take too much of your federal budget on personnel because at the end, the schools will not have enough money. Do you all know the one school that we have that is not by title? We have one school, Hayes Cooper. Hayes Cooper is our one school that does not get title funds. They don't qualify for title. So all of our other schools get title funds. So we cannot pay for a teacher or anything with title dollars and put it at Hayes Cooper. 
We can't do it that way. So when we get all that title money from Title I, Title II, Title IV, Title V, we, Hayes Cooper gets none of that money. Only monies that they get is general budget money. And that comes from the school district, which came from the state and the local funds. Go through. Yes. Good question. So the district now is a CEP district. That means all of our children eat free. Every kid, Miss Newsom did a really good job, and she got that done. Took her about a year to get it done. So all of our kids eat free lunch. So there's some there's a formula in, at MDE that I wish my federal programs person were here and she can tell you because she showed it to me because I was trying to make Hayes Cooper get some federal dollars, but they didn't meet the criteria. Actually, Bell is barely making it to get federal dollars by the formula set by MDE. So we're trying to keep them in. We just got to find out what we need to do to make sure because they're right on that line to not get the federal dollars. I'm, I, wish, I wish Hayes Cooper was federal so I can do some other stuff um, because we would get more federal money than they would get more money to spend. But they're not a federal school. Um, go, Neil. One. Yeah, yeah. All right, our salaries are 70% of our budget. 70% of our budget is salaries, which is not bad at all. But we have, we have bills to pay. So, for example, when you have older structures, your bills are higher than normal. Any of you own, own an older home that is not as well insulated as the newer homes, your air conditioning and heating bills are kind of higher than it would be if it was a more modern home. We have that same problem in our schools. It's small things that we have to do to keep the district running. Lights, gas, water, um, and then those things that we have no clue that's going to happen. And they happen. And we didn't plan for them. So we have to do it. And most of our time, most of the time they're big ticket items. I'll come to the board and I'll say, this is broken. We didn't know. Or Mr. Harrington had come to me, Murphy's Law. Worst possible thing can happen at the worst possible time. First day of school, uh, Dr. Belcher, we got three um, air conditioners that broke at this school, and we got to get them fixed. And then you all start hearing it and say, oh, they don't have air over here. Well, it just broke. We, we had no clue. And so we didn't budget for it. So we got to find a way to move some money around to pay for that. So it's, it's a complex thing that happens throughout. That's why this bond issue is so important. I know you don't get all the glitz and the glamour that you want, but you can fix a lot of the things that are old that really needs to be fixed. We have a lot of things that we need to fix. It's very, very important for the kids. Like you said, if we're, we're going to do something for the kids, let's do it for them. Hayes Cooper needs a um, parking lot, don't they? That big hole in the front over there, when you're going out, this school needs a parking lot. This school needs a roof. This school needs flooding. This school needs painting. There's a lot of things that we need. But when you're doing your budget, you're looking for $1.7 million. You can't cut. Someone asked me, cut athletics. If I cut every stipend and I cut the budget for athletics, I'm nowhere near there. It's not even close. So you have to see what your biggest chunk of money is, and that's athletics. I mean, that's um, personnel. So you have to move people around and try to figure out how you're going to pay them without going through the budget. Hit it, Neil. Go ahead. Yeah. We're right there. We have some master leases um, that we're paying over $500,000 a year for different things. Um, we had master leases that started in 2010 all the way up to 2018 um, with a total of over $9 million that has happened over the years. So we have bills just like everybody else has bills in their homes. We have to pay those bills. So when you go and get the new furniture or the new car and you have a car note, well, we have loans that we've gotten. We've gotten buses over the years. We've had things done to buildings over the years. 
things that needed to be done. Those upgrades at um, Naylor, there are things that the board took action on that needed to be done. We needed buses, didn't have buses with air and heat. It's 100 something degrees on the bus in the summertime. Needed some buses. So now we have to pay all this money back. And that comes out of your budget as well. And we have maintenance. I just talked about the maintenance. We have so many things we need to fix. We have a long list. Right now, our priority things to fix, a roof at Pyramid, a roof at the middle school, a roof at Cypress Park, flooding at the middle school, a parking lot at the CTE, a parking lot here, a parking lot at Hayes, walls up at um, Pyramid. Do you all know that Pyramid does not have walls that go all the way up to the ceiling? Did you know that Bell has a section of their school that do not have walls to go all the way up? DM Smith do not have walls to go all the way up. And when you fix those things, you have to redo your HVAC. So you have to run it different. And that's extra cost as well. Those are priority things. That's not even the little bitty things. We're talking major cost, major. We're not talking about $50,000 or $20,000. We're talking 800,000, a million dollars. We're talking a lot of money. But it has to be fixed. Those three roofs have to be fixed. There's no doubt. All right, where were the reductions? Central office, that was the first place we started. We started there. We started at central office before school even started. My prediction was, I said that we are going to take a cut and we had already taken a cut. We have four positions at central office that we took away. We never hired for. So we gave everybody else extra duties. We cut four positions. Started there before we hit any school. We're at bare minimum at central office. So then we did the maintenance department, gave some cuts up. Transportation did some things. We touched everybody to give up something. All schools, vacancies. If the principal had a vacancy and I set them down and I said, can you live without this vacancy, without filling this vacancy? They said, yeah, I can live without it. We took it. We took the vacancies that they can live without so that we don't have to let additional people go. Because even though it's a vacancy, you're still budgeted to pay for it. It can be a blank person right there. It can just say vacancy for third grade math we still budget for it. So if I take it away, it's like taking a person. And we were trying to get to that number. Um, class consolidations. Some of the classes will be larger next year because we had a couple schools that the principal came and said, you know what, I don't need that other teacher. I'm looking at my numbers. I can just put those two classes in together and that's it. To, to make sure everybody understands, there was no sit down and said, you're going to let this person go, you're going to let this person go. It, it did not happen that way. It didn't. So I understand you're concerned about Bell and Hayes Cooper and the pre-K, but I'm concerned about everybody. And as you told me, it is my job to do the budget, and that's what I'm doing. I want to clarify Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Could you could you hold on? Hold on. Wait a minute. I'm I'm not finished. I have one more. One more. All right. Multiple positions. Multiple positions at different schools. I really am proud of a lot of the principals because they knew we have been talking about this since June, July, and August. We have been talking about it. They did not hire for certain positions so that they can give the positions up, which was great. So they planned it out early and they said that they're not gonna affect their staff, which was great. That shows a good initiative by the principals as the CEOs of that building. That was awesome. Yes, ma'am. My concern is that your response when we spoke last week was to tell me that I did not understand that we did not get money from the state for our pre-K programs. 
And how long have we known that? You are speaking about all these cuts and all these things. If you knew that, were you actively out there looking for funds to fund these classrooms? And let me explain that it's not just Case Cooper and Bell. It is our school district in general should be investing in these pre-K programs because we're going to be behind the ball. All of our kids, not just those kids, all of our kids in this district that are not getting those early learning opportunities are going to be starting out kindergarten behind the rest of the state, behind the rest of the nation. And, if, and sticking them in overcrowded classrooms is not, the, is not the answer. And he just spoke to our loss of population. Our population is going to in, continue to increase because Baxter and Delta State and the other places in this town that are wanting to hire people, they will never consider coming to a town that doesn't have a strong foundational elementary school program. And if we cannot offer a pre-K program to them that is valid and not overcrowded, we're not going to get kids here, we're not going to get people here, and we're going to lose even more students. Forget private schools, that's not my concern. It's having people here. You're not going to have a population to present a bond issue to if you do not address these pre-K issues. Yes, ma'am. Well, and just to back, back up what she's saying, I mean, um, you know, you're talking about all the buildings that had been <coughs> roof and, and this building needs this, and all I can think about are children. It's the same thing. If you're going to not give them that, that foundation which they need, we're going to have to continue to put our money into um, intervention and trying to catch them up, trying to catch children up. If they start behind in pre-K, which the, the, the kindergarten assessment, um, I think that Cleveland School District, there were about 36% 36 36 of kindergartners, when they take that test at the beginning of the year, only 30, 35%, 36% of kindergartners were, had the skills, were ready to begin kindergarten. I mean, that is astonishing. That is, I mean, and then you track, my book. And then you track to when they start taking those tests and we get graded in third grade. Well, it doesn't. It, 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 you, the foundation, it's like you're talking about roofs and everything underneath it. we got to build a foundation for our children's education. And I, and I don't think that the classes are going to be overcrowded because that gives, that gives Bell, I'll just say Bell, 40, well, I'll say Hayes Cooper, that's 40 children. I don't think they have 40 children in the class as a pre-K. They will when you consolidate. You just showed us the numbers of 98 kids in a pre-K program. If you have four classrooms in our district and that's it, that's 20 per classroom, which is overcrowded. That's, and, then, and then you're looking at 80, you're, you're still- leaving. That's counting the Head Start that's in our collaborative as well, the 98. You no, said no. We have two classes no, no. The number you saw on the screen, yes. the 98, uh -huh. the Head Start is included in the 98. How many kids do we have in our 4K program right now? It's over 80. 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 Over And it's interesting that you say that because in the new stimulus package, 
They gave each governor $4 billion. To, they said, I said in the new stimulus package, they gave each governor $4 billion. They gave you $4 billion to do what you want to do with. So Dr. Wright, the state superintendent, went to the legislature and asked them to fully fund pre-K. So there was no answer to that just yet. But she asked, because the governor can do whatever he wants to do with this $4 billion. So she asked for it, in which we should, I think we should get it as well. Uh, Dean Thompson, mm -hmm. our representative, hasn't he been in Washington, D.C., and knows everybody? And uh, Senator Simmons as well, and uh, Mr. Hudson as well. He's in the back back there, and Mr. Hudson. I saw you, Mr. Hudson. <laughs> I saw you. Sure. Yes. No. That's potential new money. From what I read. And, and you and I talked this week. I appreciate you for taking my call. Yes, sir. I got so many calls from folks in this room uh, that I wanted to make sure that I came back and kind of listened for myself. Uh, the one question I do have about collaboratives is, is this. I know um, with these collaboratives, you can solicit funds for the program. Uh, and it's a way to raise money. I know Tallahassee County about three or four years ago actually reached out to my wife and I because Morgan Freeman's daughter runs the, the yeah. uh, collaboration over there. And so they reached out, they had this major fundraising effort. Uh, is it too late for us to begin some kind of, excuse me, just for one moment? Get it. Uh, is it too late for us to uh, go into some kind of fundraising effort uh, because we're really fighting hard in the legislature uh, for pre-K, and so for, for us to be shutting it down, uh, honestly, to me, it's tough to see that in my community. So I'm hopeful, like this lady over here said, maybe we can stick something to the wall and come up with some solutions. And I'm about to throw something. All right, community contribution opportunity. So, as a community, yes. Ways to raise some funding for that program. I'm finna get it right here. All right. How can the community assist? Attend school and community meetings like you did tonight. I do not mind the phone calls. I do not mind the emails. I love it when you come. I do, because it makes everybody think. Become a member of a school-based community team. All the, all the schools are trying to get teams together to be in the community. The third one, pause before posting. Make sure you contact your schools or central office for accurate information. The fourth one, contact legislators to fully fund MAP and pre-K programs. The last one, donate to school, donate to district to receive a tax credit. You can donate to the school and receive a tax credit. Ms. Patsy Clerk, which is over our ELC, has all that information. You can donate your state taxes. You can donate in. You can say, I, pay, I gave the school district $2,000. You get a letter, and you take it. MDE also sends you a letter, and that money can go, to, go towards our pre-K program. Yes. Yes. And so we had a donation from a, was it bank? Uh, it's been around for a while. We got this information from the um, state when we met with them last week. I, I have a problem with the react. I, I appreciate this, but in my mind, this should have been done years ago, or at least presented prior to this year as an option for helping the, us to fund our early learning collaboratives. I mean, it, it really is a problem that we are having to play catch up and react to things. And I do want to comment on your pause before posting is I did post to social media, but I did not do so until after you and I spoke when you told me it was going to be two classrooms. You, you told me you were going to have a classroom at Bell and a classroom at Hayes Cooper. And that was what you, you told me and that they were related to this grant and that was it. So, so nothing was done before contact was made with 
I feel like so much of this meeting is a response to people actually speaking up and having taking issue with the way that our school board was managed. And rather than saying, you're right, we should talk, we should have taken a step back, we should have presented this to you. There is a lot of defensiveness. And no. we are here to discuss this. And I think this is great. But I also think that we need to take measures like this and have them presented prior to a, a situation like this. Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying. All of this was prepared before the Facebook thing. So I don't know what's all on Facebook. I don't, I don't do Facebook. I don't do social media. So the only thing I get is whatever somebody screenshots or whatever and sends to me, but I don't do that. But all of this information that we collected from MDE, you're right, it could have been done years ago, but we don't live in the past. Let's live in right now. I wasn't here years ago. I was here a year ago, yeah. And if Well, we didn't, we didn't see that we were going to lose this many children either. We didn't know. We had no clue. No one knew in the state. No one knew how much it was going to be. I didn't think we were going to lose that many. We didn't find that out until January okay. this month. I, I agree with that. Yes, sir. You told me you've been working on this in September. If you're not allowed to mix state funds with private tuition to fund the pre-K, you could have been working since September to get the private. I mean, you know, all funding from us, the community. I, I agree with that. We didn't know. that are lost. So you come here and we get a $47 million bill jingling in front of us. This is what you could have. Also, we need you to bail out your pre -K. Well, can I, can I say about the September? We were working on September to see about enrollment. We were really trying to wait to see if our enrollment was going to go up. We wanted the enrollment to go up by December so we can get a snapshot. Because they take a snapshot and then that's what you get. So all of the other planning, we were hoping that we wouldn't have such a big deficit. But when we got to December, we were still at that number. Actually, the number got larger. Well, we do, we do not know that because there was also something that we sent in to the state to ask them if we can use a three-year average of enrollment before. So that decision would not be coming back to us probably until April, May. So that when we get our funding, it would equal that three-year average before this year. We sent that in the MDE as well. We don't do vouchers. We stopped doing the vouchers. We, and I, I don't have any recollection of a voucher. Yes. Yes. Yes, they're trying to do it, but we do not know if they're going to do that until April, May. So we could. Have one extra. We could. So, so we won't know about pre-K until April. Is that what you're saying? I'm confused. I just want to make sure I understand. We won't know until pre-K probably about, yeah, April. The f I, I, can, I can tell you this, we're going to have pre-K, the number of classes, we're waiting on the collaboratives. Because they, it'll be April. People are going to, I mean, they're going to find another place. They're going to find another place. That's so collaborative. Always this late and late. 
know? Well, the collaborative, the collaborative is always this late, but the collaborative has always said that they're going to get a certain amount of money all the time. Like she told me from, told us from MDE, she is very sketchy on how much money they're going to give everybody in the collaborative this year due to the cutbacks. Why on the MDE website does Bolivar County have five locations listed as part of the collaborative and three of those are in the school system? I have no clue. Big part of the problem. If you look at the early learning collaborative, the legislation, it started out and written as it says those who may be four years or older by X date. I think it's September. September first. So the early learning if you fit that, that yes. Learning collaborative. Yes. Three K's on the other side of that. But if you look later in the early learning collaborative, it covers a three K aspect. So that's where some of the legislators were like, all right, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't clear. Because 4K is, is part of this that we keep talking about, mm -hmm. and I get your concern about 3K. We are writing the AG's office now with the estate auditor's office to try to get this clear. There's that four-year-old requirement. However, later in the, in the, in the RELC uh, statutes, it talks about a three-year-old. So can you do it? Can you mix that money and be okay? It says three and four, three year and four year old. Exactly. But if the very beginning of the ELC says four years old, it's September the first. So it's the people who written here. So it's a little bit of inconsistency. Well, we have we have Chad Walker, who is very active in this. So we're trying to get them involved to get this clear as quickly as we possibly can. You're saying there is a possibility that a 3K could come back to this. There is that possibility, yes, with private funds, with, with money parents. raised, with partially parent funding. There is that possibility. If they didn't come to the to, to y'all with this problem, you wouldn't then. Yes. We came with them. Are you serious? Yes. When there's hundred other schools doing this in the state. Wow. What would have happened if we didn't go to them? <laughs> you went to them and said I'm gonna voluntarily cut the foot off for you. No, we've, we've, we voluntarily reported something. If we did not report it, as, as they said to us when we did report it, this is a lot better than somebody telling on you or us finding it. So we self-reported. You didn't take any time to try to find a solution before you. But we had already broke it. There's, and like I said before, and like I said before, we self-reported. Uh, they said that was a good job. The people that's going to audit you, those are the people that we reported to. So if you don't report it. I, I have no clue. I don't know.
that it's actually $96,000. Teachers do not get paid that much. I know you were probably freaking out, but <laughs> no. they consider salary and benefits as well. Okay. So the program itself with just the personnel is $96,000. So there's two different issues. When we're talking about pre-K, I know people are just getting like confused. I can tell some people confused back here. When you talk about pre-K, we're talking about one site at Hayes Cooper that is tuition based that I'm very proud of, by the way, okay? And I get a little emotional talking about it because I have a fabulous teacher that oversee that program and it's been wonderful, okay? And it's been a great recruitment tool for Hayes Cooper. As you can see, our enrollment is lower for different reasons. But it's still an excellent school and I think we should retrain students and recruit them. And that was a recruiting tool. Um, but the 4K, we've had 4K at Hayes Cooper since 1999. I don't know how it's funded before. I'm not into funding that much. But we've had it since 1999. When it first started, it was tuition based itself also. But then it changed. And I don't remember what group it was. I think it was the group right before my son that, um, that it's now, you know, it's free. It's made free. We had three 4Ks at Hayes Cooper. And then I decided to make one of my 4Ks a 3K. And Bell has still retained the 3K. When we got to be part of the Early Learning Childhood Collaborative, we added a site at Naylor and at um, Parks. Right now we have 84 students enrolled in the 3K program at District Y. Um, and Thank you. I appreciate it. So in conclusion, um, we're having to make hard decisions, tough decisions based on things that a lot of people don't like. And I, I understand that. I never take it personal. It's not personal. Um, you're defending your, your platform or your claim, and I respect that. Um, I'm not going to go out here talking ugly about anybody. You ain't here doing what you need to do. But at the end of the day, I have to do what I have to do as well. Um, I have a great responsibility as well, not only for the teaching and learning that goes along, but the operations that happen and the financial stability of this district. And um, I, uh, I appreciate you all coming out. And um, yes. In your proposal for the renewal of the early learning project application, are you proposing that we go from seven sites to only four? Two. Four. Okay, seven classrooms to only four. Yes. So again, like I said earlier, we're still cutting students and we're maximizing it 20 students per classroom, which is not feasible, even though it's allowed. And so why do we have to only ask for four? Can we not ask for five? You're not asking for a number of classrooms. There are a number of students within the collaborative. We've got to have at least 90 students. And we'll have at least 90. Well, we have 84 in a low, I mean, we, in a low enrollment year. No, so uh, the other kids from the Head Start count in our collaborative numbers. So we have well over that. Mm -hmm. Well over 84 already. That number I put up there a while ago was the total number that we have this year. I think it was 98 total. Last one. Yes, there's, a, there's an email address under school board. You click on the school board, I think it's school board, and it'll give you all the school board members. No, it's not? Okay, we will get that up there for you. I thought it was on there.
I like that. I, I like that. That's good. I, we keep talking about this early learning collaborative, and is it outside the realm of possibility to ask our school district, even if we can't get this early learning collaborative, because I've spoken to other school districts who have pre-K programs outside of the collaborative, to fund additional classrooms that would bring children into our programs? I mean, if, if we have four classrooms that are a part of the collaborative, then why can't we have a fifth so that we are, are not overcrowding our classrooms and you're asking us to consider a bond issue, and and I don't feel like we can trust that our children's best interests are being considered right now. Because the collaborative doesn't pay for the four classes. The schools are in the collaborative. The collaborative is only going to give us $225,000. $225,000 is not going to cover four. So the district has skin in the game. We are putting money in. And I, I think that the district needs to what is best in terms of an investment for getting children into our school district and bringing families into our school programs. I mean, you're going to have a lot of families that aren't going to want to, you know, fight for a spot in a 20-person classroom. There's not. And the last thing I'm going to say, I promise, because I realize we've been here a long time, but there is, and I wrote it down, there is an Open Meetings Act. It protects the right of voters to know what is going on in any public meeting. I have tried to find the minutes to our board meeting, and when you discuss things in executive session, and they are not voted on clearly to where we know, as your constituents, what is going on, it is a violation of that act. And we need public records as well. And there's no reason that we cannot look at the budgets from 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 and compare those things as, as parents in this district. And right now, that is not easily accessible. And we certainly can't find our school board contact information. And we'll... I was looking everywhere. You can't get emails. You know, even if they had an email that was associated with the school district, so we didn't have to go to their personal emails, I ended up having to text board members. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to bother them at home. I would like for there to be an efficient way for us to reach them to make our voices heard. We'll get that updated tomorrow. We'll get it updated tomorrow. So what happens at the draw for 4K? Uh, Hayes Cooper and yeah, Bell are going to... They're going to do the draw the same way. And we haven't discussed that just yet. We're going to discuss that. Go ahead. Here you go.
<laughs> this is the last two. I got him and I. You still, you had one? We're going to go here first, and that's the last. Yes, sir. No, no, that's not true. We're waiting on the AG about 3K. He's going to find out from the AG because they had to write something. Sergey? Uh, I don't know if, I don't know, have you talked to the AG today? That's why we pushed this self-reported car foot. We reported to them to try to get this done as quickly as possible. Next time, no self <laughs> Okay, so like the people that are that's trying to get the kids into pre-K at Bell and Hayes Cooper, that starts Friday, I believe, right? Okay. okay what if they say, well, we can't take you because we only have so many? Uh-huh. My family don't qualify for Head Start. Gotcha. So what do I do? We're going to meet with them sometime this week. I had to have this meeting tonight. We're going to meet with them sometime this week. Then how are you going to get yes. that information? The principal will get the information out. So that will, all parents in this district can expect an email Friday from their principal <laughs> as to an update where we are on this issue? Yes. Okay. Is that what you just said? That's not what I said. Uh -huh. And as a representative of the Cleveland Middle School PTO, I'm supposed to go out and be the voice of the parents who did not want to be here tonight because of concerns. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> did not want to be here because of concerns with crowding or whatever. So what is it that you want me to tell other parents? What are you, what are, what is, you have gone around the room and I'm still trying to unpack what I'm supposed to from this meeting. We cut our foot off. I got that. We got that. <laughs> Just hold on till we get information. Hold on. Okay. That's it. I'm hold on till I get information. Yes. How am I going to get this information? Um, when we update the principals and we get the information, they we'll make sure we tell them to update the appropriate people. The draw doesn't start until Friday, I think. So for the people that we want, the people that are fighting for public And go to if they can afford it. Yeah. It is. It's a, it's a sad situation for everybody in the state. But again, I appreciate you all coming out and have a good evening. I think I was the only one not know. I think I was the only one not know.